first chapter. I'll review it and then if you have any doubts, we can ask that. Okay, so I'll just briefly over go, overview the topics. So you have a sense of what is, so you have a sense of what is going on in this chapter. And then you can ask your doubts or any topic that you may have had a harder time understanding. Okay, so not specifically questions, you can also share any topic you'd want to get more insight on. Okay. So the first chapter is introduction and neuron. It's a basic introduction to biopsychology, right? So biopsychology is the study of effect of the body on mind and the mind on body, right? We are doing more of the first, but latter is also part of the biopsychology, right? Biopsychology largely relies on um, experimental studies and case studies. So there is, uh, you'll see it on page number, one second. Page number 1.8, uh, right? Um, there are different forms of experiments and different forms of, guys, in the back, you can come sit here, there are empty chairs all along. Come. Sorry. Okay, back to biopsychology. Is that clear? What ma'am shared, everyone's clear with it? Okay. So please attempt your eyes in, in advance. If there's any issue, you have scope for addressing it. It should not be last minute for you guys. So the research in biopsychology has a very different outlook than research in biology. Because research in biology can be done with experimental uh, designs in using animals, using test subjects. Whereas when it comes to biopsychology, it is purely uh, for the sake of understanding that we are doing research, right? For example, I want to know what is the role of genetics in intelligence, right? Then I'm studying two twins. It's not like studying this is going to help me enhance something immediately. It might give me a deeper understanding of how education should be constructed and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's very um, explorative in nature, at least for the larger part of it because of which there are a lot of boundaries within which we should work. You can pass, uh, mark your attendance and pass it along. So the first kind of research, the most common kind of research till date is also experimental. Uh, but within biopsychology, experimental research is a little bit hard to do within the ethical realms. 
right? Because if I want to, let's say, understand how a child is raised, um, again, the same question I have that is intelligence genetic in nature, right? But to do that, if I want to separate the child from their parents, just to see that their parenting should not influence their uh, intellect. I can't just do that, right? I can't pick a child and be like, you'll be away from your parents just because I want to study how you're intelligent, right? Because of which we often do quasi-experimental studies. Quasi-experimental studies are when it is still an experiment, but it is done with people who are already in pre-existing conditions. For example, we'll take adopted children, right? Whose parents we know of. So we'll study their parents and the child and find out if the intelligence has a correlation, if there are similar forms of intelligence in the parent and the child. Or twin studies or studies of uh, specific groups of people. Come. Just to understand what factors might be affecting an individual's uh, biology, but when there is a pre-existing condition, for example, someone has a certain damage to amygdala of their body, to understand what is the role of amygdala, I might do more experiments on this person with proper consent to see if without an amygdala, what are the responses that their body might be missing out on which is how they have been able to figure out a lot of the role of biopsych uh, biopsychology in our day-to-day -day life. Case studies are also very relevant for biopsychology, again, because uh, independent cases like these, which have very specific conditions like right brain, left brain switching and things like that, or certain part of the brain is paralyzed or certain uh, body part is reacting in a different way, allows us to get a much deeper understanding. Um, you can come and sit here. There are seats available in the front and even there, in the corner as well. So, uh, different case studies have allowed us to get very specific insight. Uh, specifically, if we are using imaging techniques like PET scan, EEG, uh, CT scan or something, we are able to tap into the biology of an individual which we may not have been able to do so much before. And then there is correlation studies of just seeing um, what are the factors that may be associated with one another, you know, having a certain trait, how does it influence your behavior, having a certain emotional tendency, how does it influence your biology and things like that, right. So the research in biopsychology is very varied compared to research in biology even compared to research in psychology because we have a lot of ethical foundations within which we should act. Is that clear for everyone? Right, so if you get a question about different forms of uh, research in uh, biopsychology, it's also relevant to add why such differentiation exists, which may not be the same in case of many other sciences. Um, now, when we come to the areas of interest of in biopsychology, it is essential to say that there is nothing about the body that is not correlated to the mind, right? Even how you rest your body, even how your different organs, different vitals work in your body have some correlation to the hormonal structure which will influence your emotions and thoughts. But at the same time, there is a point where we need to cause a distinction. This is biology and this is psychology, right? because of which we have a lot of overlapping constructs like psychopharmacology, blood-brain barrier, endo the in effects of emotional effects of endocrine system and things like that. So if you move to page number 10, you'll see different impacts of different sections of biology on our, our psyche. Right? For example, development psychology, which is on number 5, talks about how a child grows up. Right? But when you study development psychology, which I think you will in your final year maybe or year before that, um, it talks about also how a child develops a sense of morality right? or how they develop an understanding of what is the right thing to do or who should I, um, how should I form my words, how should I communicate my feelings. But they're also in correlation with how the brain is growing. right? So it has a lot of overlaps of different sections of the body and their influence on the mind as and when we go. For example, genetics will is very obvious, you know, genetics will influence how different features of your mind and body are. There are a lot of genetic predispositions to things like anxiety and depression. There have been studies which show from somewhere ranging from 30 to 60, 70 percent of correlation between the parent and the child to uh, for the transference of even mental illnesses. Uh, even in the case of schizophrenia, there have been cases, there have been a lot of cases where they've seen that it's probably has a transferable factor 
but at the same time it is not just transferable right it is also the fact that if the other person has a much better life much stable environment around them their uh, illness may not be triggered at all so how so then they became a, a biopsychosocial model which suggests that even if you have a genetic predisposition for example i may have a genetic predisposition to anxiety but only if i reach a certain trigger will it be uh, will it get activated for me to reach that trigger i also need to make sure my social support system my uh, other components of my mental health are in place because of which i might not reach that trigger and might be stable and might not express that anxiety for which i may have a genetic predisposition for right so similarly genetics uh, will have a lot of uh, contribution in illnesses in uh, different factors like intelligence personality uh, learning memory and all of all this also has again um, a component of learned behavior right because we have a lot of overlaps when it comes to biology and psychology we can't create two specific boxes this is biology and this is psychology right and to research them we often bring together elements and see how one affects the other then there is uh, developmental psychology psychopharmacology is just effects of different medication so how they affect you uh, like how mental health uh, sorry psychiatric medications come in Psycho psychiatric medications might be affecting you you can come sit here or there yeah how psychiatric my medications might affect a person and what are the different ways so i don't know if you guys are aware but there are if you look at the types of antidepressants there are around 50 50 antidepressants available in market right i think in india probably less but in a, uh, in the us maybe 84 i think is the exact number of number of antidepressants because there's so many ways to understand your emotions there are so many ways to activate different hormones that for every person a different approach works because of which there has been a variety of uh, methods of even getting through to people with the help of pharmacology um neurodivergent disorders are disorders where can someone say what is neurodivergent disorders can you give me an example of a neurodivergent disorder autism yeah so autism is a classic example of a neurodivergent case it's essentially to say that the nervous uh, structure of your brain does not process memory in the same way um as it would for an average person so they may have social deficits uh, memory is actually just one component of it they may also have inability to drain out cues for example if i'm in this room i might be able to hear this person's pen that person's murmur and not be able to speak which would be uh, which would cause me a lot of stress and upheaval right it might also affect my social cues because i'm not able to focus and understand what you're saying it's just one component of what autism is there is a lot of biology that causes that illness um that condition um but uh, neurodivergent uh psychology is essentially deals with different forms of wiring of the brain which can lead to uh, um things like the ASD spectrum and even sometimes disabilities and even uh, conditions caused later on in life because of injury and stuff like that and then there's psychopathology which talks about illnesses specifically right we talk about mental health disorders which you will get a lot more detail on later in your course um so psychopathology is just understanding different mental illnesses different mental health disorders there have been um documentations like the DSM the diagnostic manual um which talks about what are the illnesses recognized as of today we might have eliminated some previous illnesses we might have discovered some new illnesses like for example there's a discussion on if uh, addiction to cell phone should be or social media even should be considered as a illness in the next uh, diagnostic manual that will be released i think 3 4 years from now so they keep on updating and there are few more like icd and dsm there are two big manuals which give you a list of uh, the psycho uh, the psychopathology different things that we consider illness as of today because the definition does change for example at some point having um a con having a notion that you're a man in a woman's body you feel like a man in a woman's body was considered to be a gender identity disorder right whereas now it is called gender identity dysphoria it just means you're uh, they don't think it's a disorder anymore it's a condition with which you may want to adapt in a certain way 
right? So they keep on updating this list of manual and it also has a lot of biological implications because it's associated with taking medications. It's associated with an implication of what started and triggers these things and how to even resolve these things, right? Um, then there's the sensory systems, the animal behavior and the consciousness and cognition. These are the main uh, primary areas of research. Of course, there are, there are areas of research beyond the scope. And uh, there, there are also a lot of subdivisions within age. Like even just you talk about uh, psychopathology, there is so much going on in the realm of psychopathology in terms of research. Um, so when we come to the major areas, there's physiology. What does physiology mean? What does physio mean? Anatomy means structure. Physiology means function, right? So physiology is how different functions affect your uh, psychology, right? So physiological, psycholo uh, physiological psychology deals with the function of body and how it influences different um, components of your psychology. It can include something as simple as how, let's say you have hypothyroidism. Even that is influencing your metabolism, which is influencing your mental health in a certain way. Let's say someone has diabetes, someone has uh, uh, PCOD. All of these things, I just, I'm just talking about hormones specifically, have a very significant impact on your mental health. Even deficiencies like B12 deficiency, iron deficiency will have impact on your mental health, right? So uh, physiological psychology talks about the influence of the functioning of the body in a proper manner, leading into uh, impact on your mind, uh, psychology. It can also include components like circadian rhythm, like your sleep cycle, your appetite, your uh, physical activity and things like that. Psychopharmacology uh, is another division of, uh, uh, of uh, biopsychology which observes how drugs affect neural activity and behavior. So it's a it's largely a medical approach which has somewhat of a less in, uh, in, uh, importance when it comes to psychologists, has a much larger relevance when it comes to psychiatrists because essentially all of their work is based on psychopharmacology. Uh, neuropsychology, cognitive neuroscience, which you have already studied a whole paper on, so I don't need to explain you what that is. Uh, comparative psychology and psychophysiology. Uh, I think these are pretty basic. You'll just understand them from as, from as you go. Um, I'm just seeing if, yeah. So the, the last component, if you move to page number 16, is really relevant for us because ethics in psychology is a big uh, concern and a point of understanding that needs to be very strongly rooted in anyone, right? Uh, right now, from the point of view of biopsychology, but even from the point of view as a practitioner, ethics are very, very relevant for every psychology, uh, psychologist to understand in any component of their research. Just let's say if I'm observing two twins um, on a test for their intelligence, right? And I realized, I just, my experiment was to see if they might have difference in intelligence. One turned out to be really smart, one turned out to be um, not as well performing on the same exam. Seeing, I need to be aware that how will this result impact my audience, right? How will these children feel having participated in my experiment? What if when they come for this experiment and go through this experiment, I damage their self-esteem into making them feel that they are inferior to their sibling, right? Even a small experiment like that of testing two twins or their intelligence can have an impact on someone's uh, mental health negatively for a lifetime. So we cannot take anything lightly when it comes to this. We cannot sit back and say, I don't want to think of the consequences. I'm doing it for the point of view of research. Because even one human being's life matters, right? Even if whatever I researched, maybe it's going to help people for thousands of years. But if one person's mental health is damaged, it's not worthwhile. So we need to be very mindful of what the ethical bounds of our research are, specifically to biopsychology, but in general in the realm of psychology. It's a very uh, tight rope that you're walking on and you should be very careful because the damage caused to another person from your activities might not, be, might not uh, get tapped into your awareness. So uh, earlier there used to be a lot of experiments happening even on animals, uh, happening a lot on human beings as well uh, before. 
but since a few experiments there was uh, there have been a lot of concerns raised about uh, the impact of unethical studies on human uh, life uh, have you all heard of the zimbardo experiment there's a stanford prison experiment have you seen the movie or something it's a very nice movie you could watch it after your exams uh, but it talks about an experiment where prisoners um, where students from Stanford University, one of the best universities in the world, were made to take roles of prisoners and prison guards on a random al allotment. So they were, say, 10 people came to participate in this experiment, 5 were given the role of prisoners, 5 were given the role of prison guards, and they were supposed to act out as if they are prisoners, as if they are prison guards, uh, for I think, I guess, 15, 20 days. Like they were given a period where they had to live in the campus in that setting, so they were given proper. Uh, dresses and names and everything, you know, identities. The experiment got so violent at the end of the week that they had to cancel the experiment. The patient started showing signs of severe depression. In just a week, the prisoners started feeling guilty, even though they had not committed any crime. They were students at a university. And the prison guards started becoming violent and beating up the prisoners, even though they knew that they were also part of the experiment, right? So this was a big uh, point in psychology where we started noticing that, you know, we can't just pick people up and ask them to do something just because we are curious how they will be. Right? We need to see what is the implication in this person's life. If someone's getting depressed after that experiment, I need to take ownership of that experiment. So Zimbardo had to cancel out that experiment. The minute one of the students uh, got violent towards the other, the prison guards got violent toward the uh, prisoner. And when he did, uh, you know, take an outtake form, he realized that their mental health had significantly declined in just that small amount of period. Um, so since then, there have been many protocols in place to make sure we are being ethical, we are being mindful of how what we are doing impacts those who are coming in for our research. So this, these components are very relevant um, even today, more so today than before. Um, so first is informed consent, letting them know what is going to happen to them. So even if someone comes in for therapy, the first thing is this, a disclosure of what is going to happen to them. They get to hear about it, and then only they are allowed to decide if they want to participate or not participate. I cannot tell someone that, you know, you come and sit here, and actually the experiment's going to happen later on, uh, but actually this was the experiment, right, that I was going to make you wait and see how you reacted if I turn the house on, uh, you know, uh, alarm and something like that. To do studies like that, we need to be very mindful and be assured that the people can take whatever is being given to them. Privacy and confidentiality, so people have the right that whatever information is taken from them is not revealed with an, any identity labels about them, right? I can't do a study today about a footballer who um, l injured his leg and publish it tomorrow knowing if I know who the person, if the study will be able to, you know, identify the person. So you need to be very careful that no data gets leaked out. Uh, every psychologist, every researcher is very mindful of maintaining the privacy of their data, right? Um, risk and benefit analysis, so just ensuring that you are being mindful of the risk you might cause your subjects in the study that you intend to perform. Right? Um, using of animal subjects, so earlier there have been a lot of studies on animal subjects because they exhibited very similar to human behaviors. For example, there's a study on baby monkeys. It's a very sad study. If you see the videos on YouTube, it just makes me cry every time. Um, but uh, these baby monkeys were taken away from their mothers. And they were, one pair of the uh, monkeys were given a soft teddy bear-like um, mother, like a fake mother, obviously. And another section in the same cage was of a mechanical mother, which was just feeding them. So when they wanted food, they'd go to this robotic mother and get fed from the bottle that was there. And there was a teddy bear mother also available to them. So what they, uh, I'm calling it teddy bear, but it's like a stuffed toy, really, right? So what they did was then they turned off some blaring sounds and very stressful environment for the monkeys, making it sound like they're in danger to see who would they go to. Would they go to their provider or would they go to someone that seems warm? Because the teddy bear was not providing them actually any uh, support, right? The food feeding was done by the mechanical mother. The, it was also patting their back and stuff like that when they were eating or something. But it was realized that when they were put under stressful condition, they moved to the teddy bear mother, right? But when the experiment was viewed, 
a few times, I mean, not a few times, when it was became public, it was also criticized for having that negative emotional impact on the animal itself. Because you're just trying to torture them, right? And see how will they react in torture. So uh, later on, even for animal studies, there have been significant ethical guidelines of what you can and cannot do and what is the risk benefit analysis of doing that. Maybe let's say I want to study some medicines on um, mice and frogs. It's understandable because this is going to imply that a lot of lives will be saved if I'm able to fame this medicine. But if I'm just curious about something, then there is not enough benefit. So the studies might not get approved. So most studies have to go through ethical board approval. Uh, at every university, there's a board of ethics which will approve your study. Uh, if you're doing it with animals, then there's a specific board for that. And if you're doing it with humans, there's a specific board for that to approve that your study has qualified uh, the ethical realms even before you start the study. You first have to get that approval, then only can you pursue your like thesis projects. Mm. Yeah, studies, uh, then there are studies that require administration of chemical and radiation on animal subjects because they're not possible to be done on the human subjects. For, when, for example, when PET scan, CT scan were first developed, a lot of studies being done on animals to just see how would they react to different radiations. Uh, then deception, so uh, deception is sim something similar to like I said. For example, I asked 10 people to come sit for an experiment. I said, this is a waiting room, just wait here. The experiment is there. And I actually, this is my experiment room, right? So this is deception. Uh, or for example, I call, in, call them in on one um, premise and actually I'm doing something else with them entirely, right? Uh, deception is helpful because it kills the placebo effect of them being observed. It kills out the effect of them knowing uh, what could happen or preparing ahead of time for what is gonna happen. Um, but also it can have a negative impact on them feeling deceived, them feeling cheated or lied to or if, I, if they ever find out, I mean, which they will, they have the right to know the results of the study, they might feel like they have been, um, you know, observed without consent because they did not give consent to be observed in the waiting room or for what was to be happening, right? So reception is also, there are ethical ways to perform it, but it's a very uh, thin line to walk on and it's done, so we should be done very carefully, if allowed at all. So again, the Board of Ethics usually decides if it's okay or not okay to do it. And there's data fabrication. People often falsify, not often, people sometimes falsify data just to get the result that they want, right? Because whenever we start a research, we want to, we have some hypothesis in our mind. If I'm doing a research on, um, does, is using your phone more than three hours a day cause damage to your neurons? Somewhere I want to say yes, that's why I'm doing it, right? Otherwise, why will I study it? But when I find out that it's not happening, people have been seen to falsify data because it's human subjects. It's kind of easier to falsify data than any other science because we, can't, we are not taking every subject there, right? Our readings are more uh, observed. So it's very important that the integrity of data is maintained. There are also many tests to now check this. There are a lot of reliability checks to ensure statistically made checks to just ensure that the data that is coming through is authentic and has validity to it. And then there's respect for participants, you know, just simply not seeing them as test subjects to play around and fiddle with. They're human beings as much as you are. So uh, seeing how to treat them with proper uh, respect of their boundaries or what's okay for them. So uh, oftentimes when you do, have you done experiments in this semester? Pra practicals, you've not done experiments in. Um, but if you ever get a chance, you'll see that you, there's a lot of reference before point that you have to tell them they can leave at any point, right? And you have to also tell them what will happen if they leave. They still have the access to all the conclusions of the study. You, you have to give them time to form a bond and understand what is happening and a lot of things like that. So you have to ensure that the participant feels respected and valued for being in that space. Uh, yeah, other than that, just proper, uh, you know, proper conditions uh, is also important just to maintain proper conditions um, for the clients, sorry, for the participants. Um, and from the point of view of seeing what the implications of it will be in the society, right? You, um, even how you're sharing your findings is also relevant to check because we are dealing with human subjects. If I release an information on 
what is happening on a certain star, it's not going to influence the mindsets of people. But if I release a study saying, um, in which I just change the title into women, um, just something like anti-feminist or anti-men or anything like that, I could trigger a lot of social behavior, right? So psychologists more so have responsibility of presenting their research with an ethical understanding of what the implications of the words they choose will be. Because of which often studies, I mean studies are often done in groups anyway, uh, in a, any realm of research. But here there's a lot of check from ethical boards, from supervisors, from peer reviews, just to ensure that what you're doing is Im not causing a negative impact on anyone in this society, right? So that is about the first chapter. Do you have any doubts from this chapter? Anyone has any questions, any doubts? Okay. We'll move on to the second chapter, neurons. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just briefly overview these things, right? So when we come to neurons, the most important part is understanding the structure of a single neuron. What are the different components? What are the different functions of each component? So soma, exon, dendrite, how these components influence the functioning of a neuron? Because this is one such cell which is highly, highly advanced. Right? If you compare its functioning to an RBC, to a, a bone marrow cell, to any other cell in the body, it's highly advanced. Because of it, it cannot even be regenerated, right? It's that uh, unique in its structure. It's that fundamental in its origin. It can only be generated in a child's body. There's very few regenerations possible of neurons. And the structure is so refined because it's a very quick action um, system, right? It, it helps you respond to almost any in, impulse immediately, right? If there's the flows on fire, I know what to do impulsively. Um, so the structure of a neuron is very relevant from just an understanding point of view and even from the exam point of view. Um, I don't want to get into detail because that will take too much time, but just read up about how the transference of an impulse happens. There's a, uh, there's a diagram, I think, in the function of neuron. No, sorry. In the action potential in, uh, uh, imp impulse of neuron. Yeah, that's the neuron itself. I meant to say this one. Right, how the impulse travels. Yeah, that one. Which also is a very uh, important step in understanding the nervous system because this is the point of which of understanding any sensory motor coordination that is happening in your body. The rest of the things are purely theoretical and I think you'll be able to grasp an understanding. You've already studied the blood-brain barrier, the different types of neurons and the other, other kinds of cells. I feel like those are simple and you'll be able to grasp it as you go along. Uh, but just pay some more attention to the action potential and how it transfers because it's a functional utility of the brain and uh, it'll just clarify a lot about how the structure is as well for you. Yes, it's also relevant for the exam point of view, yeah. I mean, everything's important. It's not like I'm making the paper. I don't know anything about the paper, just letting you know ahead of time. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a relatively theoretical chapter, so you'll be able to get a grasp on this once you move ahead. Just uh, keep in mind that try to have a broader understanding of things and fill in the details because it can get a little taxing to have so many sub points and so much biology. This chapter has the least amount of psychology in biopsychology, right? Uh, but it, it's the base for understanding everything else that happens in the next chapter, the, the uh, brain and behavior chapter, right? So just uh, try to keep a broader understanding of what is happening and you'll be able to fill in with the details. So moving on to brain and behavior, it starts off with a simplic understanding, a simplic, simplistic understanding of the nervous system and what are the different components. Um, you go on to understand in detail about different parts of the brain. Uh, actually, first you talk about the meninges and the cerebrospinal fluid and the uh, arachnoid spade and stuff like that. Just giving you, <clears throat> just giving you an overview of what what's happening in the back. 
Can there be less murmur, please? Thank you. Um, so the nervous system, uh, largely the peripheral nervous system, we have covered an understanding of that in the neural uh, chapter, the chapter before. Uh, in this chapter, largely it talks about different components of brain and how they are associated with different brain functions of psychology. Right. So there are uh, there's relevant for every part of the relevance for every part of the brain in psychology. For instance, if you can open up to what's a diagram of the brain, right? Page three point five. Oh, sorry. Page 60, figure 3.5, right? it's just a basic diagram of the brain, but it will help you visualize that every part is relevant in psychology from a different point of view. Right? This part is processing the language, this part is processing the vision, this part is processing your intelligence, certain parts are processing your emotions like amygdala, certain parts is processing your appetite, your, uh, your sexual drive, your uh, sleep cycles. Right? So, so many components of the human psychology are processed in different parts of the brain. So, it becomes very relevant for us to understand how they are correlated and associated with one another. Right? It is again a very theoretical chapter, but at the same time has a lot of relevance to mental health. Has a lot of relevance to how different components are affecting, uh, how different biological uh, conditions are affecting your uh, mental health. Uh, let me see if the brain imaging is also an interesting component. Um, if you go on to do further studies in psychology or even if you probably do some internship, you might get to do these activities yourself. Um, page number 68 of SLM or you can just uh, listen also that's fine. So brain imaging talks about different ways in which we have been able to study the functioning of a human brain. See, any guys, any um, study done on behavior is largely easy because it's an external study. But when we have to study the brain, firstly, it's so complicated, we've never been able to go inside, like we don't know what the functioning of midbrain is completely even till date. And more and more studies are coming up, but it's still hard because a live person's brain cannot be meddled with, it will severely damage their functioning. There are very, very ethical norms to ensure you don't damage someone's brain, thankfully. And then a dead person's brain doesn't give you the function. And psychologists are interested in function. We don't care what it looks like, how many cells it has, we know, want to know what it does. So from the point of view of psychology, the most relevant uh, point in the brain, psych uh, the brain's anatomy and physiology is these scans. CT scan, MRI, fMRI, and PET scan. These are few labeled here, other than other like EEG, which are also uh, available in labs once you, I mean, if you pursue higher education in psychology. You will, you get to participate in experiments and see how different, for example, there are studies using an EEG cap to see how it impacts on the peacefulness of your mind if you're listening to a certain kind of waves or if you're breathing in a certain way. So you could even scientifically check if let's say a meditation will actually be calming for a person. Or you could uh, scientifically check if a person has a certain illness, what part of their brain is more or less activated, right? So it's a highly relevant part for us. There are many, many more medical tests, but for us these scans are most relevant because this is the only part where we get some functional input of what's happening to a person, right? Uh, more so in fMRI, we'll get a very functional input. We'll get things as they're going, it's a visual. But even in other parts, we have ways of experimenting to find out um, with case studies or with quasi-experimental style to see how the brain and psychology are correlated. Uh, then there's the endocrine system. I'll just briefly review it. I know we, are, we only have a few minutes left. Um, just saying that be mindful of which parts, uh, which parts are relevant for what functioning and then their implication in psychology, right? So you have a list of all the, uh, all the glands and how their function is influencing different parts of the body. Uh, some that may be more relevant than others are the pituitary gland because it has a lot of 
it has a lot of controlling hormones it is limiting and controlling release of other hormones it's a master's gland it's called a master's gland because it is controlling secretions in other parts of your body as well right so pay a little bit more attention here other components have direct and indirect impact on your uh, on your implications for psychology as well so obviously adrenaline has the biggest because it is an anxiety stimulating hormone and it is the most relevant illness in today's world and the gonadotropins and how um, the sexual hormones also play a role in understanding of mental health might be relevant to understand clearly if you have any doubts from the remaining three chapters you can stay back otherwise i think you can leave yeah anyone has any doubts oh sorry she gave it to me hmm? sorry history of biopsychology is important yeah it is important that's why it's in the book <laughs> just understand the overview of things huh? this might not come as a separate question but this might come as a note what is x-ray x-ray is part of the ct scan if you see the scanning imaging of the brain third chapter I uh, let me get next chapter. Can't say that that MRI is not in our syllabus. No it is. See? When did it say? When was it said? See? But so say that MRI is just understand what it does. It will it's not like they're going to get a whole note on MRI, but you might get a note on brain imaging and what it does. So you should know a little bit about it just briefly review it, yeah. um it's basically saying when neurons begin to die ahead of time so it might happen in conditions like uh, alzheimers right so it's when your uh, basic functions of the brain get compromised